Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Carol Ortenberg, the editor of NOSH. I'm joining you from my home in Boston. And today we're continuing our coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on the food and beverage industry. As part of our series of video interviews about the effects of this evolving situation, today we're going to discuss how the pandemic has changed the investment landscape and how emerging food and beverage brands should keep this information in hand when thinking about possible exits. Joining us now from Los Angeles is Mark Rampola, a co-founder and managing partner at Power Plant Ventures, a growth equity fund investing in plant-focused consumer food, beverage, and food service companies. Mark is also on the board of directors for Beanfield Snacks, Hail Mary, Vive Organics, The Collaborative, Flying Embers, and Own. Before launching Power Plant, Mark was the founder and CEO at Zico Coconut Water, which he sold in 2013 to Coca-Cola. We're really excited to have you on today. Mark, first and foremost, how are you doing and how are your portfolio companies doing? Personally, I'm doing really well. Um, yeah, I think this is a challenging time for a lot of people. Fortunately, my uh, my wife and our girls, we like each other, so we're spending quite a bit of time together and it's been a great experience. Um, with our companies, it's, it's mixed. Um, most of them are doing uh, really well, uh, some doing extremely well, some are struggling, frankly. And it creates a very difficult and challenging circumstances. What I know is all of them, from CEOs down, are working day and night, like probably most of your listeners, trying to navigate this time and prepare for the for the new normal that's coming our way. So what are you guys kind of hearing about what this new normal looks like? Yeah, look, I think, you know, first of all, everybody understands, I think, by this point that um, COVID is... Is serious, and you know we don't know exactly how long that's going to take to play out, but the implications are are, are massive and long lasting. And and I think by all accounts, it's pretty clear we are in a recession, and that is likely to last for some time and overlap and follow the immediate effects of COVID. And so, um, you know, we're not we're not sure. Um, you know, nobody can predict exactly what's going to happen, but I think smart companies are at least beginning to face the reality that there's going to be a new reality, right? It's going to be different ways that consumers shop, the way that they consume food, the way they learn about food, and uh, where they get it, how they procure it, what they do with it. And so uh, it's going to be different for different categories and, and different brands. But I think you know, the reality is that uh, consumer behavior is going to change materially uh, uh, due to this. So, Mark, you mentioned this changing in um, climate for consumers. One thing that's not changing is brands are still looking for capital, and I'm sure you're right. getting approached by Many companies who are looking for power plant to become that strategic financial partner in them. What are you looking to hear from brands right now um, during their capital search? Great question. Um, look, I'd say first and foremost, it's that they're facing reality. Um, this is not a time for BS. This is not a time for the big sales pitch. I want to hear from companies that they are keenly aware what's going on in the world, how they fit into the world. Certainly want to hear about the big vision and is that vi has that vision changed in any way um, given the circumstances where they think, they think things are going to go. I certainly want to understand the nuts and bolts of the business. How are they performing pre-COVID? What's happening in real time in, in quarter one or whatever period of time they're in? And, and what they're forecasting and seeing for the rest of the uh, rest of the year. And I also love and expect businesses to understand this is not going to last forever on either end. Some businesses are doing uh, extraordinarily well, and it, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to last forever. That, uh, you know, if they're selling masks right now, is are they going to sell at that level for the next 10 years? Yeah, I don't know if that's the case. And on the flip side, some brands that are really struggling, we don't necessarily assume that that's going to be the case, but I just want to know that they're facing reality. Second of all, I want to understand how their business has changed and how they're thinking about it differently. Every business, every entrepreneur, every operator needs to think about their business differently. There are big challenges, big opportunities. So I want to understand what, how did they view the world before? How did they view their business before? And what's changed? What are they doing differently? How have they retooled? How are they thinking about it differently? And then finally, of course, is understanding their capital needs, right? What, where were they in the process pre-COVID? Where are they now? How are they thinking about their name needs? 
um, how hopefully they're, they're, they're learn to become more cash efficient. It may need not need, it may not mean that they don't need any capital, but are they more cash efficient than they expected to be? What's happening with their existing investors? Are they in desperate need of cash or what's their time frame? That's all stuff that can at least help us understand better if and, and when it's appropriate for us to get engaged. And in general, I want to know the people being realistic, you know, and, and being both pragmatic paranoid and prepared. And those are the kind of entrepreneurs we think we want to, we, we know we want to work with because this is a time when it's going to be great, great leaders that build their brands and, and build great companies through this time and, and can go on to, to survive and, and thrive afterwards. Pragmatic, paranoid, and prepared gives new meaning to a uh, PPP, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about that, but yes, it does. It does. Is that different than what you want to hear from your existing uh, portfolio companies that you have capital already placed in? Yeah, good, good question. Um, not really. It, it's it's the same general message. I think even more so, more honesty, more direct. You know, certainly I understand new companies are trying to position themselves, but with our existing companies, it is time to let us know exactly what's going on. And I think that advice applies to any of these companies and their investors and boards. It's not time to hide. It's not time to, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, share bad news early and often is our sort of catchphrase with companies. We cannot be of any help if we don't know what's going on, and uh, we can be supportive if we do. And so we want to we want to be have an honest, real conversations about the, the the especially the bad and ugly. The you know the good will will be there, but um, if you address the bad and ugly, you can you have a better chance of getting through this time. What's more important for you to see that these CEOs are really thinking through every single detail or able to think big picture? How do you kind of suggest they balance the two of those things? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, we talk about it as sort of macro and micro. And look, you know, you've got to have a macro perspective, right? You got to understand and think about how this might impact your business over time. But the reality is businesses will live and die in the micro. They will live and die by the decisions they make daily, weekly, monthly in the coming months. And so that's going to be critical. You know, I, we don't expect uh, our, our businesses to be you know, economists or business leaders to be economists or futurists. And, and we really you know, don't believe there's we sh any of us should be speculating on exactly what the future is going to bring. If, if we focus, if an entrepreneur focuses on the details, you know, keeping their business running, being cash efficient, uh, ensuring that your existing business is strong and secure, being rational about how you approach this, managing your team and risk and supply chain. Those are the details that are going to matter. And, and I believe fundamentally that this is a time for details and action. It is a time for uh, wartime CEOs, uh, not uh, sort of broad visionaries. What does that mean exactly to you, a wartime CEO? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, it's a little catchphrase from those uh, Godfather fans on, uh, in your in your audience that um, from uh, uh, wartime consigliere that uh, uh, that Michael needed from his father uh, during during a fantastic scene in that movie. And look, what it means to me is it's um, it is a time to face reality, be extremely pragmatic understand um, the importance of staying calm, yet being decisive. And what we've seen, and I think everybody knows this, is you know, we all have our time and place in the world. And, and sometimes we're called to you know, certain actions at certain times. And you know, we've seen some leaders uh, really able to step up, lead their teams, get ahead of it, face reality, make radical, dramatic changes in their business. And I've talked to a lot of CEOs that are deers, deer in the headlights. They, they, they just they think reality is the same. They, 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 their business is doing fine. They had a good Q1. You know, they haven't made any changes. I just don't think they're facing reality. So it's hard to pin down exactly what it means. And we're actually doing a little bit of work to try to identify that so we, we know it for the future. But I think all around us, we're going to see great leaders, people that really step up. And I encourage as CEOs, you know, maybe you are struggling, you know, that's okay. Find the people in your organization you can really rely on that love challenges, love difficult times and see that there's a way through this to build a better business. Speaking of struggling a little bit, 
it's very easy to get caught up in those details though and feel overwhelmed by everything you need to think about in your business. So how do you avoid that end of the spectrum as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, look, I, I think it starts with acknowledging those feelings, right? We, we all have them. It's inevitable. It's natural. And there's very little we can do to control it, right? That's Those feelings are there. And so acknowledge them, at least to yourself. You know, the fear, the doubt, the insecurities. I encourage people to write about them. Um, it helps to sort of get it out there and acknowledge them. Um, there's some good techniques, uh, one of which is, sort of refuting them, acknowledge the fears, and then figure out ways to think about way, how that can create an opportunity. Um, I really encourage people, if they ha don't have it already, to, to, to build a close confidant relationship with someone. Could be an advisor, one particular person on your board, or an investor, or a peer, another CEO that's going through similar challenges. Could be a coach, could even be a therapist. Um, we all need someone we can confide in uh, the CEO role, especially, is a lonely place to be in the midst of a crisis, and we all need someone we can rely on. And the third third thing I'd say is take care of yourself. Uh, you're no good to anyone if you have a breakdown. And so you need to know what that means for you. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you working out? Are you eating healthy? Are you taking some time away? Are you taking time with your family? Are you you know, shutting down occasionally and creating some breaks during your day. Um, we have to take care of ourselves to be able to be good to anyone during this time. And the fourth thing I'd say is, look, you know, recognize that this too shall pass. You know, th th there will be an end to this at some point. And, and there's, there's, there's something in that that, at least for me and I think others, gives them energy to say, look, we're going to get through this. And I have a role to play. And, and we each have a role to play. The companies that they're running are important. You're creating jobs. You're bringing goods and services to people. That's a critical role. See that as, and, and let, let that empower you to keep, keep driving forward. And in the midst of that, there will be opportunities. This is going to be an amazing time to you know, build businesses, to uh, create new products and services. It's going to be challenging, but the brands that can break through during this time and build deep, engaging consumer relationships, solve problems for them in novel ways, have the chance to build this, uh, build brands that last forever. That's a pretty inspiring view of the future. Mm -hmm. um, changing gears a little bit, for many brands, that future includes an exit to a strategic, mm -hmm. and they see that as the way that they can build a brand that really lasts for a long time. Are you hearing anything from strategics, and, and how is that impacting sort of the investment climate right now? Yeah, interesting question. You know, I've, I've said over the years to, to entrepreneurs that you know, if you got into this business to sell, uh, you're kidding yourself. And this was pre-COVID. If you got into this business to, you know, uh, make an impact, you know, bring a product or service that people know and, and want, want to know, want to use, want to love, and you're committed to do that for the next 20, 10, 20, 30 years, regardless of the outcome, maybe you have a shot of success, right? That is all the more true today. Strategics are sitting back. The ones we're talking to, look, they're trying to sort out their own businesses. Um, some of them are doing fantastic, uh, at least on the sales basis, but they're trying to figure out what their new normal is going to look like. A lot of them have been hit really hard in the markets on market cap and their their valuation. And so, yeah, we're, we're hearing strategics are pausing. They want to they assess, they want to learn, they want to rethink about the world. I do not see a lot of exits happening soon. They'll happen eventually. They'll, they'll get back in that game. But who knows when? It's going to take a few years, I think. So we certainly are encouraging our companies do not expect anytime soon. Think again about a three to five year time frame. And this is a time to build great businesses that can last standalone and can be built to be acquired, not built to be sold. Does that change in the horizon impact how you're investing through PowerPlant? Sure, of course. Uh, you know what we recognize is both the the um, it, you know it's a it's a it's an ecosystem, right? It's a food chain, and so to the extent that strategics are less interested in acquiring, and that may be delayed, and they've got different requirements they're going to look at. They're going to look a lot more at size, I believe wanting to have businesses that can plug into their systems a little more easily. They're going to look at, at, at uh, margins more heavily than ever. They're going to look at businesses that have cash flow 
positive cash flow or can contribute in a very realistic period of time, positive cash flow. And they're going to look at businesses and brands that can be accretive on a value basis, on a sales basis, so they can get a payout in a reasonable period of time based on typical metrics like payback, and cash flow, and all those things. So all that cascades down to the way we view investing going forward, right? We, we want to look, we're even going to be more critical of slightly larger businesses that we think sort of minimize risk a little bit more, uh, businesses that are obsessed with not only grow, growth, but growing profitably, strong margins, real clear path to cash flow positive uh, uh, status, um, and world-class entrepreneurs, or I should say just very, very strong uh, entrepreneurs and teams, because this is going to be a long haul, a difficult time, and uh, and, and we know, you know, we, we believe we need to find the right partnerships to make that last. So it absolutely is changing. Same fundamental perspective. We believe plant-based is real. We believe brands will break through, and we believe that great companies eventually will, will find a way to be acquired. Uh, it just forces us to be even more disciplined on the way we approach our investing. You and I have talked a lot about valuations and how we've seen those creep up uh, over the past few years. How do you see this kind of impacting that side of the business? Uh, yeah, there's no question. It's it's being impacted already. Um, we are seeing deals come in, deals get done on on a very different lens, and it just it just makes sense. You know, this is. No one is immune from the economic cycles, and this is a cycle like one we've never been in before. And so given str strategics are going to pause, given strategics may be, um, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe more cautious about the investments they're making, given they always will try to push down valuations themselves, we have to look at it that way as well. We also have to look at it and say, this business may, you know, where, where previously we might have been able to underwrite a three to five year exit. What if it's seven to 10? Uh, what if the future we're going into and the business is going into is unknown? How much capital are they going to need? How much time are they going to need? What, what kind of risks are there in, 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 in this business? And so all that gets factored into the way we underwrite a company. And it's, like, it's not like we want to pressure just to pressure. We've got to rationally look at every investment we make and believe we are protecting capital we're doing the right thing for our investors. We're we're assessing the risk and making the most rational decision possible. So, it is affecting valuations, and it will continue to affect valuations. That being said, great companies will be funded, and 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 um, we think there's going to be um, some investors leaving the sector, others um, probably a little bit more cautious, and all of that sort of on a supply and demand basis with less capital available and active is going to we think put pressure on valuations as well. Now, you kind of know about this firsthand. At Zico, you raised capital in 2009. Uh, right. Did you learn anything from that experience that maybe is a, a great piece of advice for emerging brands now? Yeah, well, whether it's a great piece of advice or not, I, I'll, I'll share some things with you. The, the, the question alone, Carol, is bringing back, a, bringing a little bit of PTSD for me. Uh, those were some difficult times, and, and I think these are even more challenging times in many ways. And um, there's more capital available today than there was then, but there's also more uncertainty. And, and so it creates some real challenges. For, for Zico back then, and for me personally, uh, that was a difficult time. We did not have a major investor. We were predominantly you know, small individual investors and in family offices. And uh, we were burning money and, 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 and had losses, so we needed to fund that to continue to grow. And my recollection is, you know, first of all, we doubled down on New York. That was predominantly our business at that time. And, uh, and though we you know, had some business in other places, we wanted to make sure we won where we were. And that focus helped us tell a story to investors. Um, we had, the, I, I recall, having a lot more meetings uh, to get uh, capital than, than I thought it would have taken. Um, and frankly, the terms came in uh, much less uh, lofty than I had hoped previously. Um, and so th those are just the decisions you got to make and navigate. And we did decide to do uh, a series of capital raises that were probably not on uh, the most favorable terms uh, had, had it been two years earlier. But at the end of the day, I believe that we could still create value. It just made it a little bit harder for, for my team and I and, and our early investors to you know, do the work necessary to, to do that. So I'd say, look, double down on your business. Make sure you know your business better than ever. Focus on what really is important. Be brutal about markets and customers and 
products and channels that are not profitable, at least on a contribution basis. Um, talk to your existing investors closely, make sure they understand your business. That's going to always be your best source of capital. And then hopefully never put yourself in a situation where you're desperate, where you have some capital, you have some run rate, you've reduced expenses, you've elongated the period of time you can run without capital or have creative ways to kind of bridge that and open up conversations with, um, with more strategic investors, you know, funds, uh, institutional investors earlier. So when you do need it, uh, you're, you're ready and it's not, the first, it's, it's not a call of desperation. Mark, we've talked a little bit about leadership skills and the investment climate. I want to pivot to products a little bit. You're in the interesting position of running a fund focused on plant-based products. How are you guys viewing how this crisis is going to impact consumers' adoption of plant-based items? We hear so much about potential meat shortages and issues at meat plants. Have you seen more interest in in plant-based items? Overall, most of our companies are doing uh, very well. Some are doing extraordinarily well. Now, some are challenged. Anyone that has exposure to food service, you know, restaurants or or uh, colleges or typical food service businesses is, is, is struggling with at least that piece of their business. Most of them we've seen, though, able to make that up and then some with uh, typical retail and e-commerce as well. So, so yeah, look, I think, the, I think the overall thesis for us remains valid. Consumers on the margin, we think, are moving more towards healthy, natural ways of living. They're concerned about what they eat and where it's sourced and how it's processed. And, um, and the impact it has. And, and that that lends itself to a plant-based uh, diet. And, and we think that trend is going to continue. You know, On the margin, you'll things, see things move. I, I think there's uh, quite a lot of refrigerators and freezers around the country that are stocked with meat. But certainly, I think um, um, we're seeing uh, dramatically increased demand for our company's products. And we think that trend is going to continue. You know, one thing that's interesting to me is, you know, although there's certainly an an indirect, you know, connection. Uh, well, actually, very quite direct, but um, in, in in where COVID came from, right? In 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 the, in the food supply, an exotic connection, let's say. But I do think on the margin, consumers are going to become more concerned and aware about where their products come from, where they source, and understand that the interactions we have with animals um, has direct benefits, uh, direct challenges to our health um, and, and and to our food system. And so, um, yeah, we think this trend is going to continue. If you were a plant-based company right now, what would you do to help convert customers over to your products and drive trial? Yeah, great question. You know, we are generally recommend with our companies, um, you know, focus first on your existing consumers, your existing channels, your existing customers, right? That's the most important thing. How do you, how do you ensure that during this difficult time, they turn to your brands and products and love them even more. Are you able to get to their homes? Are you creating different routes to market? Are you engaging them in different ways? That's the first place to start. Second of all, I think when you talk about new consumers and new habits, we really encourage companies to think about uh, who are they targeting? What's that usage occasion? What problem do they have? What's the reality of the situation they're in today? And make sure your offerings compelling in that in that way. So, is it is it you know meal delivery? You know we're invested in one company that's um, Thistle, and, and you know their their ability to deliver meals during this environment is is critical. And what they're finding is first and foremost their business is up with existing consumers, but they're also finding new consumers that are are you know adopting those products into their daily lives. Will that continue forever? People are going to go back to restaurants. They're going to go back to work. But on the margin, if you can build a brand that saw, you know, use this opportunity and solve a problem with your brand or product for particular consumers, we believe that you're going to be able to get some mind space um, and some share of stomach and wallet that will last when this crisis is over. Well, Mark, I really want to thank you for sharing these words of wisdom and advice for all the brands out there. Thank you so much for joining us here today, and uh, we look forward to continuing to see how your portfolio companies grow during this time. Thanks, Carol. Appreciate your questions, and, and have a good day.